All right, welcome to the second part of this tutorial on how to analyze the data that you get from um, doing a tensile test. And uh, if you watched the previous video, we just got done uh, taking the data that we have, our displacement and force data, and changing it into strain and stress. And we've made a couple of graphs here. So we've got um, a force and displacement graph and we have a stress and strain graph. And even though they look very, very similar, you have to remember that they have different scales on them. So if you look at, like, for instance, the y-axis, check it out here. Compare the stress y-axis to the force y-axis. Yeah, here we're only going by 100s, whereas over here we're going by 10,000s. So it does make a difference which graph you use um, when you're doing your various calculations. And remember that we change over to the stress-strain curve so that it doesn't really matter what size sample we just tested. We might have tested a really small sample or a very large one, but by converting these values to stress and strain, it takes out um, any variation based on the size of the sample. So we have to talk about a few different spots on this graph. Let's start um, back here with the force and displacement graph because there's really only one thing right now that I want to get off of this graph, and that is calculating the modulus of elasticity. So um, let's take a look at the formula. We'll slide over here a little bit. And the formula for modulus of elasticity, if you are looking at a force and displacement graph, is fairly complex. Now, it might look a little bit familiar here. We've got F2 minus F1 over delta 2 minus delta 1. And of course, F is the force and delta is the displacement. So if you're thinking, hey, uh, isn't that kind of like y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, like slope? Then you're thinking exactly right. It really is like slope. The only difference is that we have to include in there L0, the original sample length, and A0, the original cross-sectional area, because we still have got the sample size is part of this graph right now. So to get the modulus of elasticity, you have to do this whole entire equation. Now, for our particular data, we have, um, let's see if I can get rid of that little thing, there we go. <laughs> for our data, we have L0 was um, 3 quarters of an inch, so that was the original length of the sample, or the, the original length of the testing space on the sample, and the original cross-sectional area was point 0, 1, 2 square inches. So you'd need those two values to go right here in the equation. And then for this test, um, we need a couple of points off the linear part of the graph. Now you have to make a judgment call about where you think the linear part of the graph is. Um, I'm going to mark two points here and I'll show you how to do it. Let's see, um, maybe I'll take one point from right here. And I just clicked twice. The first time it showed a bunch of points, the second time it showed one point. And so I'm going to focus in on this one point right now. And to get it to show up a little bit better, I'm going to do a two-finger click on it and say Format the Data Point. And let's put a marker on it, maybe this little diamond. And we'll make it kind of large so you can actually see it. We'll go size 10. And um, we'll even make it a color so it's even easier to see. All right, so now you can see there's my first point that we're going to use. And the second point, um, I'm going to stop somewhere up here. And really, it doesn't matter where you choose your two points from as long as they come from what you believe to be the linear portion of the graph. I see a few little wiggles in here and a few little, it looks a little bit crooked down here. So as a result, I'm not going to go right down here at 0, 0 or all the way up at the top. I think I'll choose my other point to be right about there. Okay. Again, two finger click. Format the data point. Let's do our marker style of the diamond again. Make it size 10. And we'll do that fill with the orange again, just like last time. OK, so there are the two points that I'll be using to fill in the values for um, uh, displacement and force. And Excel is actually really nice because it'll label those points for you. You can see here that right now I'm mousing over um, the point and it's showing me what the value is, but you can actually make it so that shows on the graph all the time. Just do a two-finger click again. 
And when it says uh, add data label, okay, right now all it gave us was the 220, which is the Y value, but we can certainly format this data label. Okay, two finger click again. All the time here I'm doing two finger click. Format the data label and tell it I want to see the X value and the Y value. Okay, now I realize that's kind of small. Um, maybe you can't see it very well in the video, so I will make it quite a bit larger. And maybe even bigger than that. Let's go with 18. Whew, all right. So right now, we can see that this point is 0.006 and 220. And I'll do the same thing up above. Add data label. And format data label. Show me the X's and the Y's and make it quite a bit bigger. Okay, so for this particular test, the numbers that I'll be using here for F2, F1, Delta 2, Delta 1 will come from um, these two points that I just labeled over on the side. So my first one looks like it's 0 0.006, comma, 220. And the other one is 0 0.013, comma, 589. Okay. So F is the forces. Those two are the 220 and the 589. And delta is the displacement, that's the point zero zero six and the point zero one three. Those numbers get substituted in with the length and the area. And uh, voila, you should have your modulus of elasticity. And I need to pause this video and go let my dog. All right, so that is the one and only calculation we're going to do from the force and displacement graph. Everything else is going to come from the stress strain curve. So let's flip over to that one, and we'll focus on it. Okay, so might as well pick up where we left off. I want to compare the modulus of elasticity that we just got working from the force and displacement graph and compare it to what you would get if you calculated modulus of elasticity here on the um, stress strain graph. So let's do the same thing. Now notice the equation is a little bit simpler this time. It's just stress 2 minus stress 1 over strain 2 minus strain 1. And the reason for that being once you've calculated with stress and strain, you've taken out the original area and length of the sample. So that is now a much simpler calculation because we've already uh, basically thrown out the size of the sample. So just like before, let's pick a couple spots from the linear portion and throw them into this equation. Uh, I'm going to, let's see, I'll pick about the same place as we were before. So format the data point. Okay, and let's pick one more, and again, I'll pick fairly close to where I was last time. Okay, those two points show up. Let's go ahead and make it label them with their numeric values as well, their coordinates. So two finger click, add the data label and then two finger click, format the data label. Okay, same thing here. Add data label, format data label, and then let's make them big. Oops. We really just need to highlight the text inside this text box. There it is. OK, 
Okay, so there are the two points that we're going to use. And we're pretty much going to use those two points and calculate the slope between them. So the first one is 0 0.008, 18,333. Well, I guess I'll take that comma out of there so we don't have two commas in a row. And the other point that we're going to use is 0 0.017 and 49,083. So using those two points right there and finding the slope between them, uh, I don't have the calculator with me right now and I don't really want to take the time to do this calculation in the tutorial, but hopefully we would be getting values that are fairly close together. Now, if you don't get the same modulus of elasticity for both calculations, whether you're doing it from the force displacement way or the um, stress strain way, uh, the reason might be because of the measurements you took before we did the tensile sample test. So for instance, if you didn't measure very accurately when we got the cross-sectional area, then that might affect your modulus of elasticity. Or same thing with the testing region, like if we didn't actually measure where the uniform um, testing region was, like the original length, then that case too might cause us to get some pretty crazy values. Now overall, like we're probably going to get stuff that's up in the millions here, or at least fairly high values for the modulus of elasticity. So keep in mind, you know, a couple thousand units different is not that big of a deal. Okay, so without knowing what we actually get for our modulus of elasticity, I'm going to go on and come back to talk about this stress strain curve a little bit more. So now let's focus in on it a little bit because we're going to label a few different points here that are important to this graph. The first one is where the graph stops being linear. This is called the proportional limit or the elastic limit and I'm going to guess it's right around this area and just like last time um, I think I'll make it stand out somehow. So I'll put a marker st style on it. Maybe we'll do the square this time. And let's do a color. Let's do something extra bright this time, like maybe yellow. OK, so that spot right there, um, the elastic limit or the proportional limit where the graph stops being linear represents where if you put on enough strain uh, that goes up to this point, anything before that, if you release the sample, it would actually spring back to its original size. Now, you, in your head, you're probably thinking like, oh my gosh, like a rubber band. But really, the amount of stretch that's going on here is so small, we would have a hard time seeing it with the naked eye. So in this area, if you release it anywhere down here, it will spring back to its original shape. So let's label this kind of an important spot. So I'll go to the home screen and add a text box, I think, if it'll let me, please. Hmm. Evidently, it doesn't want to let me do a text box right now. Hey, there we go. We'll cheat a little bit. I added a data label, and now I'll just retype in it. I'll call this the um, proportional limit or elastic limit. Make that bigger so everybody can see it. There we go. Okay. Now, um, the next point that we're going to label is probably the most challenging one to look for. It's called the yield point, or the yield yield point, or the yield stress. And at this point in the test, um, after it usually happens after the elastic limit, 
and there's a lot of sudden give in the sample. It's like, oh, it gives up, I yield. And so a lot of times in your graph you see this with um, a sudden shift to the right in the graph. But right now it's kind of tough to see on this particular one that we're working with, with this brass sample. So it happens fairly often that it's kind of tough to see. So as a result, there's a method that we use called the 0.2% offset method. And what you do is you want to add um, a shape. So we're going to insert a shape. And we're going to make a nice straight line here and use this to help us find where the yield point is at. Okay, so right now that is pretty darn close here. I'll change it to a different color so you can actually see what we're working with. There we go, now it's red. Okay, that one right there pretty much represents the slope that we were working with for our modulus of elasticity. However, to get the yield point, we usually take a line that's parallel to our linear part of the graph and offset it by 0 0.002 from where the graph, where the original line hits the bottom axis down here. So if I am estimating that this line would hit the x-axis at approximately there, notice that our scale goes from 0 up to 0 0.010, so pretty much up from 0 to 10 thousandths, and I want to move two thousandths over. So uh, I would guess that right where we're at right now is pretty darn close to about two thousandths over from where we were to begin. And you can see that it intersects the graph right there. All right, I'm going to mark that point, and, and hopefully it'll let me select it. I might need to move our line out of the way, but remember where it's at. There, that's pretty darn close to where we just were. That point right there is going to be our yield point. And so it's like a way to estimate where the yield point is at if it's really tough to see. And it, like I say, it happens fairly often. So as a result, that's why this method has been created, to give you a way to find the yield point, even if it's not obvious. Okay, let's get rid of that red line too so we can see what we're doing. This little one right here is our yield point. Let's get our text box back. And we will label it. And move it right up above here. So, so far, we've got two spots labeled, the proportional limit, otherwise known as the elastic limit, and the yield point, the place where there's a sudden elongation of the sample. The next spot we're going to label is what looks like the maximum height on the graph, so where the graph hits its highest spot possible. So, it looks like, based on the numbers that I'm seeing here, 62,083 is the highest point that this graph reaches. Okay, so I'll label that one right there. Let's format the data point. Oops, I forgot to make it bigger. This one is labeled the ultimate stress. This is the place where the stress hits its maximum. I'm going to move this guy up a little bit. There we go. Okay, so that is the ultimate stress. And after this point, You'll notice that 
the force that the sample is feeling, I'm sorry, not the force, but the stress that the sample is feeling starts to go down. So the funny part is, if I applied, like right here, this point is about 50,000 um, PSI of strain. If I applied 50,000 PSI over here, it shows that that's still before the elastic limit. So if I start at the beginning and I applied 50,000 PSI and then let go, the sample would be okay. It would spring back to its original size. But once it's past this elastic limit and the yield point and hits its ultimate stress, it's gone beyond the point of being able to go back to its original size. And now um, even 50,000 over here, or if you notice, keep going, this spot down here where we have something crazy happen because the graph drops right off, 37,883 PSI is called the breaking stress. That's where the sample actually broke at. So you can see it's been weakened. It's actually um, getting weaker and weaker the whole time here because you have necking going on. So the sample is getting thinner because it's being pulled apart. And because of that reason, it's not able to hold as much force. So we have one last spot to label. That's this spot right over here. And let's add a data or add a data point right there as well. And we will label this one. Oh, that's bad. Thank goodness for Command Z. There we go. We will call this the breaking or rupture stress. All right, let's go ahead and just call it the breaking or rupture point. Yeah, I'm having some trouble. All I want to do is make it larger. There we go. <laughs> All right, third time's a charm. There we go. Finally, the breaking or rupture point is right there. And that's when the sample actually snaps into two. Okay, so we've got a few different things that are labeled here. We've got the two points that we use to find our modulus of elasticity. We've got the proportional limit, the yield point, the ultimate stress, and the breaking or rupture point. So those are the points that give you the properties of brass. They tell you about how brass behaves when it's being put under tension. Um, if you have any questions about this tutorial, you should probably check the PowerPoint that comes with all of our Project Lead the Way material, or you can also shoot me an email and uh, see what else we can figure out about it. All right, have a great day.